Welcome, welcome, welcome in everyone. Good evening. Thanks for being with us tonight. My name is Colleen Curlin. I lead the programming for the battery. Um, it's nice to have you all here with us. I want to start by thanking you for being flexible for us uh, updating the location for this to a virtual event. Um, we're looking forward to tonight's discussion and glad you all can be here with us tonight. As we all come out of isolation, as we face through COVID, it's important for us to remember that there's a population that remains in isolation. Prisoners experiencing the double sentencing of solitary confinement. So tonight, two of our wonderful Battery Creative and Residents will share about an innovative theatrical tour designed to raise awareness about solitary confinement and the inhumanity of prisons. It's my pleasure to welcome J.D. Schramm and Sarah Shord. Sarah will share about her passion and experience that led her to write the play, The Box, and secure the Pulitzer Center to serve as a lead sponsor for the End of Isolation Tour. To share a little bit more about Sarah and J.D., Sarah is a trauma-informed investigative journalist, playwright, and 2019 Stanford JSK Knight Fellow. For the last 12 years, her work has focused on exposing the impact of mass incarceration and exploring alternatives. She's written two books, a memoir about the year that she spent as a political hostage in Iran, and the second, an anthology of testimonies she collected from inmates across the United States during her three-year investigation into solitary confinement in prisons. And joining her in conversation is J.D. Schramm. J.D. is an author, keynote speaker, and communication coach and consultant. He wrote a large portion of his first book, Communicate with Mastery, at the Battery. He also serves as a volunteer coach for many nonprofit organizations who participate in Pitch Night for Battery Powered. And for nearly 20 years, he's taught leadership communication to students at Stanford Graduate School of Business, Columbia Strategic Communication Program, and NYU's Stern School of Business. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. We are recording tonight's talk and we'll share a link um, once we're complete on our Battery TV page. And we're going to be doing Q&A towards the end of using the chat, so feel free to type questions and ideas and anything there and we'll drop, be dropping links in the chat where you can find out more about the tour. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, J.D. Pauline, thank you so much. And uh, I'll echo your acknowledgement and thanks to the people who are joining us via Zoom. Uh, I, I see a few familiar faces and many unfamiliar faces. So I look forward uh, to tonight's conversation. And uh, it, what are we, uh, uh, 17 years into the pandemic? I'm not sure how long, it just feels like it's been forever. Um, to choose on a Monday night to put yourself into one more Zoom conversation. Truly, truly, uh, Sarah and I appreciate it. And, uh, and then to put yourself into a conversation that is for many of us unfamiliar and or uncomfortable to look at the prison system here in this country as well as a little bit abroad. Uh, and, uh, and, to, and to have that kind of a heavy conversation. And yet, for me, these conversations bring an optimism and a lightness to it because it reminds me that um, we can make a difference. We can make changes in the way our, our world is operating. And so um, that's what uh, my intention is for the evening is to not only help educate you, um, but also to see that, that there are possibilities for things to look and to be different. Uh, about the first half of this is gonna be a conversation that I have uh, primarily with Sarah. Um, we also have uh, Carlos Aguirre with us, who is one of the actors in the production. Uh, I'll be asking him a couple of questions, but then by about seven o'clock, a few minutes after seven, I wanna turn it into much more of a conversation with all of you. Uh, where we can have your questions, either about the box and the tour, which we'll talk about, or uh, about mass incarceration and solitary confinement and, and the prison system from uh, our experience or our research of it. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it will uh, be more interactive in the second half. If a question comes to you, pop it in the chat, either directly to me, if you want it to be you know, not visible to everyone or just drop it in the chat to everyone. Uh, 
and uh, and then I'll I'll build up a bank of questions uh, that I can ask, and if we need to clarify, I'm ask you to unmute and and I'll um, have more of a conversation that way. Um, and um, uh, I thought that probably one of the best ways to just get a, a framing of both the show the box, which Sarah wrote, as well as uh, the um, tour, the end of isolation tour, which is is uh, the production of the box around the U.S. Uh, that we are are launching uh, in September. Uh, I thought the best thing would be just to show you a brief promotional video. This is, I'm only going to give you about three minutes of this video, but I think it gives them a really good context for today's conversation. So let me pull that up. Second here. Oops, that's the wrong video clip. Just a second. There we go. About 12 years ago, I came home from being held as a political hostage in Iran. I was held for 410 days in solitary confinement. And when I came back to this country, even though I was surrounded by community, it was hard for me to know how to heal. I already knew that prison in our country had long lost its will to rehabilitate. But I was still shocked to learn that solitary confinement was being used on such a massive scale and that the threat of psychological torture was the control mechanism that enabled us to warehouse millions of human beings in such an inhumane way. I started to write prisoners in solitary confinement across the country, and one of these people was Rafael Cacique. Rafael was in solitary confinement in Pelican Bay Prison for 13 years for having the name of another prisoner in a book in his cell. Rafa would have died in solitary confinement, but instead he joined the largest prisoner hunger strike in U.S. history, which led to a historic legal settlement that freed him and almost a thousand others who'd been in solitary for over 10 years in California. Rafa and the California prisoner hunger strike were inspiration for my play, The Box. We've now done three productions and reached thousands of people across California, including a production in the former penitentiary on Alcatraz Island. A few years ago, I wrote a new, scalable version with a smaller cast and a much more affordable production. Last year, we worked with the Pulitzer Center on a Zoom production, which invited audiences to mine their own experiences of isolation during the pandemic for greater empathy for people inside our prisons. Now we're hitting the road. The end of the isolation tour will take place in fall of 2021. We're going to buy a bus, wrap it in a mural, that delivers the message of collective care, transformative justice, and hope, and renovate the inside to sleep our crew of 10 actors and designers. The first tour will travel to five cities, Detroit, Chicago, St. Louis, Fayetteville, and New Orleans, where we will partner with local organizations or campaigns that are working to shut down a jail, prison, or solitary confinement unit or to build a Center for Transformative Justice. Our set, designed by Sean Riley, is an immersive grid with each audience member sitting on a stool inside a square that mimics both the size of a solitary confinement cell and social distancing. The grid comes apart like a puzzle and can be adapted to fit venues such as a school gymnasium, community center, or empty warehouse. Through theater, traveling visual art, and artistic ritual, our tour will create a space for collective healing. Our community partners are the lifeblood of this tour. And through scalable, impact-driven theater, we will help them elevate their efforts and reach new audiences with their campaigns. Filmmaker Bobby. Um. The, the trailer goes on, but I wanted to just begin uh, with that. We'll include the, the, the link uh, in the chat later. Um, 
But I wanted to begin with that because I felt like it gave a really good context both for the show that Sarah wrote uh, as well as the tour uh, that, that, that we have planned. And in the intro and a little bit in, in the trailer, Sarah, we, we talked a bit about your background, but I'm wondering at a, at a personal level, could you share with us what, what really prompted you to want to write this show from your own experiences in Iran? Yeah, absolutely, JD. Um, it's great to be here. As Colleen said, I'm Sarah Short, zooming in from Oakland. I'm a trauma-informed journalist, playwright, and survivor of solitary confinement. And I, it started when I moved to the Middle East 13 years ago in my late 20s. I moved to Syria and I was living there. I was teaching Iraqi refugees and Palestinian refugees in Damascus. And I had one of the best years of my life. Then I went on a trip in Northern Iraq, Iraqi Kurdistan, which at the time wasn't a war zone. And in fact, no American had ever been killed in Iraqi Kurdistan or kidnapped. It was a place that had a positive legacy when when George Bush Sr. protected the Kurds from genocide by Saddam Hussein. It has its own borders. It's an autonomous region in Iraq where adventure travel travelers go. They're, they're, they're pro-American, pro-Israeli. So we were received very well there and our guards were really down. And we went for a hike in a tourist site. We hiked too far and we were captured by Iranian border guards along an unmarked border. I was held for 410 days in solitary confinement with almost no contact with the outside world and incommunicado illegal detention. I was held as a political hostage, as a pawn in a long history of tit for tat um, negotiations behind the scenes between the Iranian government and the US government in absence of any formal diplomatic relations, which disappeared after the 1979 Islamic revolution. So we were there and um, I was there with my ex-boyfriend and our friend. I was released first. And when I was released, I fought for their release for a year. And it wasn't until they were free that I really began to feel the effects of those 410 days on, every, on my every level of my, my psyche, my spirit. Um, solitary confinement attacks the part of you that's most human, the part of you. We are relational beings. We exist, our identities are shaped and, and um, you know, bolstered by, um, by relationships with the person that sells us coffee, the person that um, always parks their car next to us that we notice, maybe never even say hi to, the people that we read, the, um, the poetry that we, um, that we take in and the nature and animals around us. In solitary confinement, all of that is taken away and life is spans out in front and behind you like a gray limitless ocean um every moment's heavy on your chest like a boulder and um it took a long time for me to heal from that experience and one of the ways that i did that was i started to reach out to prisoners in the u.s and ask them what had happened to them i had a lot of shame around around some of the things that happened to me in that cell um for all that time. And I found that it was everything that I experienced was completely normal. Uh, feeling love for, for an insect, naming parts of your body and having conversations um, that um, you know last for days. Um, the, I, I, there, there were times when I broke from reality and, and, and lost total control and was at the edge of sanity. Did but you, I, I'm curious as, as a writer and being, mm -hmm so cut off for such a long period of time. Did you ever envision during that that you would get out and write about time in prison? Yeah, I mean, that was one of the things that I think kept me going is I thought if I get out of here, I can use this experience to understand other people. Um, I didn't know the extent when I came back here and learned that we use solitary confinement in a routine way. The UN calls 14 days in solitary confinement torture and says that it can cause permanent brain damage in the frontal lobe. Um, I was in for 410 days. People in this country are put in solitary for, for next to nothing um, as a control mechanism for 
decades, for yet yeah, months, weeks, months, even decades. Um, wow. un unfathomable amount of times, far more than any other country in the world or in history. And when you began to interact with other prisoners who were um, either in or had been in solitary confinement in this country, um, what did you what did you uncover? What was like the one or two big realizations that you had that you wouldn't have had had you not done that research? That the story we're being told about who's put in solitary confinement and why is wrong. Um, it's not the most dangerous. It's not the worst of the worst. It's a sentence on top of a sentence, and it's the most vulnerable populations. Some people are put in solitary confinement, have done violent things to other prisoners. They're often victims of violence themselves. They're put in there for their own protection. They're put in there because they're LGBTQ. Um, they are put in there because they're mentally ill. That's probably the most common reason because our prisons and jails have become the de facto mental health institutions in our country. And they're full of mentally ill people and they're put in conditions that a judge said it's like putting an asthmatic person in a room with no air to put a mentally ill person in solitary confinement. They decompensate, it attacks the, the frontal lobe, which is the part of your brain that helps you make better decisions. So people that don't have the skills and the tools, whether it's communication, you know, anger management, to, to react in healthy ways are put in conditions that make it far less likely that they'll ever gain those tools and given no resources, to um, improve themselves in any way. When, you, uh, when I first started working uh, with you around this play, um, uh, that, that concept of a sentence on top of a sentence, and the first sentencing is done by a judge or a jury, but the second sentence is, is done by a prison guard or a warden. It, it, it's, it's not, it's not a, a courtroom with evidence in any way, correct? And I've heard that um, in California, 99.9% .9 of people that are, are sent to solitary confinement, they have some sort of a, an internal arraignment. Um, they all get put in solitary confinement. It's a, it's a farce of a, of a process. Whatever the guard says is believed um, and they have no recourse, no, no ability to contest their, their punishment. Yeah, yeah. And then a lot of them, they're released, if they're lucky, back into general population, but a lot of them decompensate, get longer and longer sentences because they act out inside, they're losing their minds, and they stay there until they're released and into society. So they're literally dumped on us after having undergone, you know, years of torture. Um, I, I want to, um, and when we move to Q&A and some questions are already coming in, which I really appreciate, um, I want to delve wherever the group wants to go, but I, I want to move to the play itself. Um, we we will be uh, giving show information. It will be produced in, uh, in Marin in yes. the middle of September. Um, but this show that you wrote, I believe in 2016, can you just give us like a quick snapshot of the different versions, the different <laughs> of this show? Mm -hmm. And then I want to play a really short clip, about four minutes from the show. Uh, before we talk to Carlos, but can you just kind of tell us how many different ways has this show been produced in five years? <laughs> well, what you'll have a chance to see in Marin in September is a, a pandemic inspired adaptation. Um, it's done, performed in a grid where each audience member is immersed in the, the, the theater itself in their own square, which is socially distanced. We're going to have People have to are required to be vaccinated to be there as an outdoor venue. It'll be entirely safe, and it really mimics it, social distancing and solitary confinement. So invites audiences into their experience of isolation under the pandemic, um, and to mind that experience to to understand and develop more empathy for our incarcerated population. But the first one was in 2016 um, at Z Space in San Francisco. Over 4,000 people came. Carlos performed in it. Carlos has performed in every iteration. <laughs> and um, so it'll be fun for you guys to hear from him. And we, the first one was a very expensive kind of, um, I wanted to just go all out. We had a very expensive set. And communities across the country that are fighting solitary confinement and mass incarceration on the front lines asked me to bring them the play. And when I told them the size of the cast, how expensive it was, it just wasn't feasible for communities on the front lines that are most directly affected by mass incarceration. 
So I went back to the drawing board and I rewrote it. I streamlined um, scalable version and we performed that on Alcatraz Island in 2018, no, 19, 19. Um, and that was right before the pandemic hit. And during the pandemic, uh, the Pulitzer Center asked me to do a Zoom production, which I think in many ways was the most powerful iteration yet. There's no way that I could have known when I wrote this play how resonant it would be during this era that we're all living through. Well, and that, that's a, a great segue into the clip I'm going to show everybody uh, is from the Zoom production of the show. Now, the entire Zoom production is available to watch. It's actually the only way I've experienced the show myself. And it was all performed by actors from their individual homes. And so very um, a, a phenomenal use of theater on Zoom with what we were all dealing with in the moment. I'm gonna give you just the first, the opening scene, uh, one of the opening scenes where you meet the four incarcerated uh, uh, characters that, that we get to see their journey through the show. And so let's do this a little more elegantly than last. Last time. And here we go. like Groundhog Day. Every day is the fucking same. I pretty much stick to my daily routine. Up at 4.30, roll up the lumpy pad, quick bird bath in the sink, mop up the dust, stretch. 6.30, I catch the morning news on my little low black and white. Breakfast at 7.00. I eat the food without dwelling on it much. CO shows up, leads me to the concrete box they call yard. We call it the yard run. It's supposed to give us 10 hours exercise a week, but thanks to staff shortages, bad weather, and arbitrary bullshit, we never get that much. The yard run has high walls, half the roof covered with dirty plexiglass. A little bit of sunlight come in when angle's right. Usually February, March. Sometimes even in April on a good year. I use the pull-up bars, do push-ups, some light jogging. Before I know it, the CO's back to escort me to my cell where I sit on my ass for the next 23 hours. The cops regard us as uh, wild animals. And I guess that's what some of us are, what we turned into. I unwrap the bag of lunch they handed me at breakfast. Two slices of white bread, a packet of mustard, two pieces of bologna, an apple, and a packet of Kool-Aid. I hold the meat under hot water for two minutes to cook off the slime. Get the eating part over with fast. Turn on my little old black and white. Everybody in here basically been sentenced twice. First time is what y'all know about on the outside. Court, a lawyer, sometimes a jury, all nice and constitutional. Second time, we get none of that shit. It's all done internally. That's why we call this a prison. Within a prison. We're the guys they don't know how to deal with. Some of them just nuts to begin with. Nowhere else to put them. Others, like me, uh, we comport ourselves with a little too much dignity. They put us here to break us down. Guys come in, acting tough, can't take the pressure. Things get ugly, infractions pile up, which means more time in the hole. I haven't touched another human being since I got here. Except to be cuffed up. My sentence is up in a couple of years. 
But we'll see what kind of bullshit the gods put on me before then. Uh, this shit is arbitrary, huh? Some guys never get out. Visits are no contact, phone calls prohibited, with the rare exception of a family death. We allow ten books or magazines at a time. One bar of nasty prison-issued soap. And a package of tooth powder every month. Canteen orders go in once a week. Property's restricted to six cubic feet. By the time dinner comes, it's a fucking joke. Portions get small every year. Nurse come by with medication. I write a few letters. Tune in to smooth jazz and lie down to sleep. This has been my life every day for three years. This has been my life every single day for seven years. This has been my life for 19 years. And then the show takes off from there. Um, it, it is a powerful journey through the lives of these four men and some of the Hi. jailers that they interact with. And it's still playing on my machine. There we go. Um, Carlos, you were in all four of the productions in its different iterations. What what drew you to do this? What drew you to want to be involved in the box and now ultimately the, the tour that is being planned? Um, uh, thank you for that question. Um, for me, I think, you know, telling this kind of story, I, I, I'm just, I think I was drawn to it because I'm consistently sort of in the work that I do, what I gravitate towards is work where if I can somehow be a voice for people that don't have a voice, that's kind of my main sort of impetus for the work that I do. And I feel like with this piece, it was just, um, there was so much pain in Victor, the character, Victor. And I just had this kind of relationship with that character from the beginning where I felt um, like, uh, like I was supposed to be there. Every time I do this play through the four different iterations, um, I have a sort of reason to be there beyond the play it speaks to me on that level victor is a character that you can't really do unless you're bringing a hundred percent of yourself to it you just have to it's not there's nothing you can i mean you can't really phone in anything in any performance but for the in particular these roles are there's so much uh, presence required for for these roles that for me, it requires me, it's a holistic experience. I can't just, I have to, you know, get better sleep when I'm doing this role. I have to like, just be, I have to work out. I have to like be a better person, like on so many levels to bring myself 100% to this role um, in a way that I just have an experience with a lot of other plays and roles. Um, so it also then, of course, you know, being Mexican, being uh, a, a a person of color as an actor it's an opportunity to to tell a story that's not often put on stage these are the kind of stories that we don't i mean people sometimes don't know how to react to this play because it's not a traditional thing you would see on stage and i love that <laughs> that's why that's what that's why i that's what i gravitate towards just in terms of the aesthetic of art but also the purpose the reason that we're doing this i i really feel like for me i've dedicated myself to making sure that especially in the past uh few years that if i'm doing any of this work if i'm being on stage in a play as an actor i want it to mean something beyond the role i want it to have an effect and so for me uh sarah has been uh, someone that i've just been honored to work with in that way because every time i'm called upon it's to do something beautifully epic that i just I, I just you know love being a part of so so it was initially sarah i think reached out because i was i don't know i think i was referred to her or something like that but but um but really you know for me 
it, 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 it all changed once I met Sarah and we had that first um, reading in the, it was like a fundraiser, I think. I can't remember, but we were, it was like the first stage reading and I met, I met you and Sarah and, and it was just from then on, I knew, okay, yeah, this is important and I want, this is where I belong. And th thanks for that, Carlos. And if you were to articulate, what's, what's that difference that you want to see made by this play being produced again? That's a great question. I mean, I think for me, obviously, I I want it, I want people to have more of a scope around what you know, black and brown people go through in society, and in specifically in these in, in incarcerated people that that um, are punished upon punishment, right? So for me, I'm a, I'm a person that has a, a, some some I'm an empath. So for me, I have to be careful with how I. <laughs> Sort of like how much I care about things, but for me, this is something that I can't. I have no control over. I, it speaks to me so deeply. It's such an important thing. We throw these people away, and there's so much there to foster. And I'm not. And I. And I also don't. I, this is a separate conversation. But I. I also, you know, I want to give people hope. I think that's more important than um, anything else. And so no matter what your position is, no matter where you come from, hope is something that we can universally speak. That's a language we should all be able to speak, right? So that's kind of what. Yeah, I love the way you said that. More, more scope, well, it's more hope. Um, uh, both yeah. sides of it. Yeah, it's it's not a coincidence because I am I am an MC. I do rap. So <laughs> I I'm not, so it's good that I picked up on it. Uh, you got you got bars, bro. Nice man. My 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 22 year old son would be proud of me for catching. That. Um. <laughs> And, and Sarah, before I go to questions from the audience, what do you hope to accomplish with producing this one more time? Um, the end of solitary confinement. Um, I, I think that is absolutely an inevitability in this country. I also think that um, there's no stopping the, the train that has already left the station that has exposed the complete inhumanity and ineffectiveness of our system of mass incarceration. Um, the, the, the story has already shifted for a lot of people and there's no, no unshifting it. <laughs> Once we have a, a, a truer story, a, 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 a story that portrays people as people instead of dehumanizing them and turning them into invisible you know, um, statistics, invisibilized, um, so especially with the end of isolation tour, which we've postponed until the spring and we're because of the Delta variant, um, we are going to expand it and we're partnering with Unlock the Box, an organization that has a campaign with legislation to end solitary confinement in 18 states. There's already been dozens of states that have, that have passed legislation to limit solitary confinement, but the kind of legislation that I'm interested in and that our campaign is uplifting is legislation that decarcerates. The best way to end torture in our prison system is to shrink it. Mass incarceration is in, in and of itself unavoidably inhumane. Torture is a necessary control mechanism when you're warehousing m millions, literally millions of human beings. I mean, it already eats up a huge amount of our tax dollars. If we tried to do it in a, in a humane way, if that's even possible, we could never ever afford it. Um, so we torture people instead of rehabilitating them. We torture them instead of actually letting them be, a, giving them a chance to be accountable for their crimes, to heal, and to come back to their communities ready to, to serve their communities. You kind of touched on it, but I want to jump to Yasmin's question where, where she says, um, is there reason to believe that the penal system and the arbitrariness that exists currently might change with the present focus on police accountability and the disproportionate rates right now of incarceration of black and brown individuals. The question was, is there hope yes. that it will change? Um, absolutely. Reason to believe um, that it could change. Yes, there's absolutely reason to believe that, that it could change. Um, it's been, you know, we can do so much better <laughs> than what we're doing. And um, it's gotten to the point where, you know, we've been doing this now for 30, more, more than 30 years, more than three decades. The prison population since the 70s has increased 700% and crime has stayed pretty much the same. It's slightly dipped 
Um, but slightly dipped is not what we're looking for by 700% increase. Um, it's clearly a failure. There's nothing that can say, that can prove any different. Um, it's really just a matter of enough people putting enough pressure on their politicians to stop, um, to change these laws and to, to decarcerate. Let um, me um, weave that into Ben's question about what's happening at the state level to change and reform the use of solitary confinement could you share what Senator Mark Leno shared with you about the impact of this very specific show here in California? Yeah, yeah. So in 2016, Senator Mark Leno came to see the show and he'd been trying to pass a law banning solitary confinement for juveniles called the Stop the Torture of Children Act. And the legislature Sorry, hadn't just, passed just it. the name, like Stop the Torture of Children. The fact that we need to name legislation like that mm -hmm. is stunning. Yeah, Sorry. yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine if that's your child. Um, so Senator Leno tried to pass it and they kept putting it off until the next year. And he said that going to see my play gave him the fuel to, to and, and the sort of momentum and buzz around it to finally get push that legislation through. And, and the same is, and that inspired this legislative art model of going from community to community across the country on the front lines that are, is, that are doing incredibly impactful work and elevating their work through bringing in new audiences to see this play. And not only to see the play, but to engage afterwards in dialogue. Everywhere we perform, in a way that's the most exciting. I mean, the, the performance is, is, is phenomenal. I mean, it's a show about resistance and hope and how despite all odds, people on the inside find each other across racial lines and um, engage in, in protest that changes their conditions, which is what happened in California. So the, the, the play is about um, hope. And then the engagement circle asks people to imagine a better way. How can we not only stop this torture, but start to heal our communities and be accountable to one another and, and really and truly make a safer world. Okay. Carlos, I, I know we're gonna lose you to another commitment that you have, but on that point of the, of the um, circle after the show. You've got, you pour your all into this production and then you sit there in circle with audience members discussing the impact. Can you just share a little bit about what that's like for you as a performer? I mean, there's nothing like it. I've never experienced anything like it, specifically at Alcatraz afterwards. It was just, uh, how do you say it? When you perform this play, generally speaking, when you're done as an actor, you're done. You've given everything you can for that evening and you just want to go home. But that's not the experience that I had at Alcatraz. My soul was refilled up in those circles after that draining of giving and giving. And then it's just like, boom, refilled up with people who are like who reflect first of all what you did on stage they're very proud of you they they have this look of thank you for telling that story that needs to be told but then what's more important is people that have actually been through the actual experience people that are close to these people close to this experience are then sharing their stories and and that's what really m makes you go okay this is why i'm doing this this is why i'm here and so yeah there's nothing like it no no play that i've ever experienced has that immediate sort of it's not just an audience it's, it's not like a talk back afterwards a play you know what i mean it's different than that it's a spiritual experience it's like a it's deeper than just talking about art i love it got it thank you thank you for that mm -hmm. sarah um your the production that will take place in marin in september and then the ultimate tour which you noted is not going to happen in late September and throughout October, but will happen uh, in, in the spring uh, to the cities you've identified and hopefully more. It, you've, you've not just bought a bus, but the cast and crew that you've put together are pre predominantly or majority formerly incarcerated. Can, yeah. can you appreciate Carlos being with us? Can you paint a, a portrait of the rest of the people that are putting this on mm -hmm. here and then around the country? Yeah, yeah. So we're a crew of, of 10. And we've learned how to do um, impact-driven justice, um, scalable justice theater 
in a quick and dirty and uh, relatively inexpensive way, at least compared to like, you know, Hamilton. <laughs> um, we, <laughs> um, so everything goes under the bus. We bought a bummer, a really nice um, former school bus and we're converting it into, it's called a schoolie with a, with a K. Um, it's gonna have, a, the kitchen is outboarded. It has showers, it has bunks that um, come down at night. And during the day, it's an open space with tables and a refrigerator and everything that you need that's all on the bus so we'll travel across the country um, we're hoping that next tour will be eight to ten cities and um, we'll be performing in these communities and um what else did i did i answer all the questions um the bus is the painted in a mural um the mural by dj aganas who's an amazing muralist um bay area muralist is um, also an invitation to communities into dialogue and it embodies the antidote to prison isolation really the um images of transformative justice and community-based healing got it and and can you talk about the involvement of formerly incarcerated individuals as a part of the casting half group? of us half of us are, are systems impacted or formerly incarcerated um um, we also have a really diverse crew in terms of, you know, gender, non-binary, um, LGBTQ, and three of our, four of us are formerly incarcerated, and um, one is a family member who, of, of an of a incarcerated person. So yeah, it couldn't be more lived experience. And this, I, this is also the first time I'll be acting in the play. This is my <laughs> big debut. I'm going to be playing one of the correctional officers. Got it. Got it. Um, uh, glad to take um, more questions. Uh, oh, David's got a great one. <laughs> because of exactly where I cut the trailer, can you talk about the documentary filmmaker and his role in the tour? Yes, and that's his extremely role in the in the event in Moran as well. Yes, that's one of the reasons why um, we really need to sell out um, in Marin. So I want to encourage people to come and and buy a block of tickets. Bring your friends. The tickets um, will, the footage in Marin are going to be a proof of concept for our community partners across the country. This is what we're bringing you. It's also our first time actually deploying this pandemic inspired new immersive experience and, um, and just fine tuning it. So we, Marin is, is incredibly important. And then the question was, um, how the documentary of what happens in Marin the documentary, will help yeah. you yeah. Fuel, fuel the rest of the tour. Yes, yeah. Um, so we're going to do an episode. Um, it will be episodic, released on um, like about 15 to 20 minutes on each place that we go to. And they're the history of resistance to solitary confinement and mass incarceration in that place as told through the eyes of a formerly incarcerated activist in that place. And it'll be a way for communities across the country to learn best practice from each other, what worked in this community um, to end torture and to, you know, to, to create and find a better way. Excellent. Um, there is, uh, uh, I've got one more question uh, that has come in that I want to, uh, Nelson, thank you for yours. I want to come to that uh, in a little bit. Um, but uh, while we are talking about the tour and the focus on, on Marin, um, the, the, the pandemic has not only inspired the Zoom production, but it's impacted your creative juices around the tour and the calendar. Um, how do you keep bouncing back as the pandemic, even tonight's event, had to be changed four days ago. Sarah and Carlos, how do you keep bouncing back when the pandemic seems to be getting in the way of your art? Well, it's not, um, it's not a loss if it strengthens your vision. Mm. It's never a loss. Um, this play has been cooking since 2015 and um, you know, a little more cooking is only gonna, is only gonna make it better. <laughs> <laughs> what a great what a great way of putting it um yeah um I, my i think sarah knows m m 
it doesn't matter rain snow sleet pandemic this i'm yeah. riding with this play because of the message and the message hasn't changed so for me the purpose of the play the message what we're trying to do with this play um that hasn't changed so for me as long as that's the same i'm i'm this is where i'm belong and that that's my dedication to this work excellent excellent thank you colleen um colleen just uh dropped in uh the link for uh the end of isolation uh dot org which is the um uh the the website that you can go to for um information about the tour and about the ticket prices once in a while when i first type that i get a security message um, but then the second time i hit enter it goes through so uh, uh if you get that don't worry uh, you will actually then see uh, Carlos's uh, image as illustrated by the muralist. Um, you can see the promo video that's there. And then just click on any of the three dates, September 10, 11, or 12, and that will take you directly to the Marin Shakespeare's uh, website uh, to be able to do um, uh, or to order tickets. So uh, if you get that first security message uh, when you go to endisolation.org, Get return it will go there the second time through it's not a risky site i promise you so sarah what what do you need to pull this off what 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 is required to make this show happen next month and this tour happen early next year um i mean generous donations are always what we need the most this uh, transformation is not cheap <laughs> This what we're building is um, is a lasting thing. It is it is a theater company. It's a traveling theater company. When we're done performing this play, however many tours we decide to do until this, you know, like Carlos said, until the message isn't needed anymore, we'll do another play. I'm really dying to write a play about how to do um, repair outside of prison. How like ways that communities are are taking care of each other and holding each other accountable um, and, and healing outside of, of punishment and isolation, um, otherwise known as transformative justice. But yeah, this is your investment in this play. And I do wanna ask people to invest in our play. Uh, we have raised about 80, almost 82% of, we've been really working our butts off for the last year. And the Pulitzer Center has been um, a huge help in that but we still have about $60,000 to raise. And um, just wanna ask people to stretch and, and you know, ask, show, show your commitment um, through, through your generosity in this case and, and know that it will have a tremendous amount of impact for many, many years to come. But you know, apart from money, um, <laughs> which is energy, right? And spirit, and we will take it and it will grow through us. Um, it will incubate in us and in our art and in our passion, in our hearts. Um, buying tickets, you know, blocks of tickets, um, being our grassroots ambassadors and getting your friends to come to this show. Because if we sell out the first weekend, which we're, it's looking good today, um, then we'll get to extend it one or two more weekends. So buy, um, buy a bunch of tickets and just stay in touch with us and continue to, to be in our community. And um, uh, Colleen has just dropped uh, another easier way to get to the tickets uh, with the Marin Shakespeare website. Um, and we are delighted with the partnership with Marin Shakespeare, not only for the outdoor amphitheater on the campus of Dominican, but they have a, a wonderful history and relationship of working with San Quentin and other um, prisons and formerly incarcerated individuals uh, through their the theatrical work. And so when, when Sarah came to them uh, with the idea of doing the show in their space, they were delighted and saw it as an extension of their mission. Now, were we at the battery physically in a room, we would um, be gentle about our, our invitation to consider either uh, a, a financial contribution or tickets or both. Um, and so I wanna honor the spirit of that in, in the Zoom room as well. We, we wanted tonight to be educational, 
not for people to feel like they had been at 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 a hour long sales pitch. And I also know that the folks who are on this Zoom have the capability um, uh, to help us finish this range of the of the fundraising and and uh, sell out uh, the three nights uh, uh, in September uh, 10, 11, and 12. And, and so uh, if you are able to consider a financial contribution, uh, Colleen is gonna drop the, the link for our uh, fundraising site there. Um, as of this morning, we were at almost 277,000 raised uh, on our, our, our goal of 340. And so so we're just over 80%. And those of you who have done fundraising before, you know it's that final 20% that can take a lot of energy. And so uh, uh, to whittle down that final 63,000 so that um, the production goes well in September and that we've uh, set in place everything we need for the spring tour to happen, we would welcome your support. Um, with that, there's a question, um, Sarah, that's been asked a couple of times that I wanna, I wanna pose for you as, as the final question from the group. And then if you have a final thought what about, after Can that. I ask you a question, um, JD? Is there time for that? Uh, yes, there is. I would just love to, to, for you to share a little bit about your own commitment and the way that you've stepped up to this on so many levels, you and your husband, Ken, and what, what inspired that? Absolutely. Um, as, as an educator, um, I have the privilege of, of teaching a lot of amazing students. And usually it's just that one quarter or that one class. And every once in a while, I get to have a connection with a student like I've had with Sarah Shord, where you have stayed in my life. You've become a part of the battery. You've become a part of my family. Um, and and I, I, we celebrated birthdays together this year. And the, the, the personal connection to you and, and my understanding of the show and the impact it can have. Um, Ken and I, we, we try to be as generous as possible to uh, uh, causes that we believe in and places where we feel spiritually fed. We stretch, we did a $5,000 donation and I can only think of one other charity, maybe two. Uh, that we have been able to be that generous and able to, to give uncomfortably and yet powerfully. And so that, that's been our interest and our connection. Um, and, uh, and through it, I've been able to get to know a wider circle of people and organizations that, as I said in an email to some friends uh, the other day, usually I hear problems like mass incarceration. I think I can't make a difference through this play and helping get it produced and helping raise funds for it, helping people learn about it, I feel like I can make a difference. And uh, you know, for a white guy who grew up in the Midwest, it, it's good to be a part of something that's bigger than myself. Wow. So with that, I get to ask you the question that Nelson, you have asked in two or three different ways in here. And I, I really, it was a great way for us to end uh, Nelson asked the very first question, which, which in essence was, when you go through a hor horrible ordeal like solitary confinement, is there anything positive that's a takeaway, any new appreciation? And, and is, there, is there a way that that can um, help you to do the work that you're doing now? That's a wonderful question. Um... I mean, there's no way I could choose one thing because my life was, I thought, potentially taken away from me. I didn't know if I would ever get out. Um, you know, I was being held incommunicado without charges. No one, um, they, they do, I was being charged with espionage for hiking. <laughs> so there could, be, could have been a very bad ending for that. Um, if there wasn't a movement of people fighting for me, I wouldn't have gotten out. And um, so every day is a gift. And that doesn't mean that, that um, I always live up to that challenge, but every day I try. Um, and I know that many of us do, but there's that we, I think all do actually our best to, to do that. Um, but 
I, knowing, having everything taken away from me and, and having gotten it back in particular, being able to, to be in community, that what it means to me, the relationships that I have, the connections that I have, the, the, the growth and the healing that I find in so many people. Um, and, many, and some of them are here on this call. I mean, you heard from JD, you heard from Carlos. There's, um, there's just an incredible amount of people um, that, that surround this project, that give it, that, that shape, have shaped it into what it is, including many, many people inside prisons. I can never forget that we need each other. You know, we need each other as much as we need air and fresh water and food on the table. We absolutely are bound up in one another and we need each other to survive and, and to thrive. And the, the world that we deserve is there for us. And it is absolutely in the connections that we make with each other. That is a great note to end on. Um, that we do really need each other. Um, uh, if anything that the pandemic has taught us is we can't go through this alone. It's harder alone. And the double entendre of the end of isolation and the end of our pandemic isolation as you launch this national tour, um, it's, it's remarkable and uh, it's great to be a part of it and to be able to share it with the folks at the Battery. With that, Colleen, we will turn back to you and thank you for letting us uh, have this conversation here tonight. Thank you both so much and to Carlos for sharing more about your experiences and about the play and the upcoming tour. It is really powerful, Nelson. It, it is, it's, it's very touching and um, Thank you for the work that you're doing. I'm glad that we were able to provide a platform tonight. I look forward to having a follow-up conversation in person. We will send a follow-up email with the recording that you can share with people in your network, along with the ticket, the ticket link and the donation link. If you feel uh, compelled to make a donation, we encourage you to do so. Um, it's always special for me to be able to work with our Battery Creative and Residence members who are doing such incredible work um, and sharing it with the Battery community. So thank you again. Hope you all have a wonderful night and hope to see you in Marin for the play. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you good to see you. Sarah, great to meet you. Be well, everyone. Likewise. Likewise. Be well. Hope to see you all in person sometime at the Battery. Well. <laughs> Bye -bye. Take care. Bye.